All right. All right, guys, welcome back to this episode of the Customer Discover Cast. This is your host, Ethan Halfide. I am here with Lucas Beland, who is the founder and CEO of GoLoot.io. This is game changing advertising, it is the future of mobile advertising. And Lucas will be 20, I believe, in June. Isn't that correct? That's correct. <laughs> okay. Early so days. let's, yeah, let's talk about that, Lucas. For those that don't know you out there, go ahead and, and tell them a little bit about you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me first, Ethan. This is a, a real pleasure. This is a great way to, to, to start my afternoon. Um, so Lucas, I think you did that introduction already. I'm 19 years old. I am the CEO and founder of GoLoot, which is a mobile advertising startup based in Montreal. Uh, I lead a team of 10 individuals, incredibly talented people here. And the GoLoot family is a much larger network of advisors, investors, mentors, even my parents. Uh, so it's this one big family uh, that is on a mission to change the game in mobile advertising. Intended. And to share with you a lot of information about, you know, how we got to, to, to where we are today and who I am as an individual and obviously what the company does to this day. Awesome. Very concisely spoken. I mean, man, at 19, what got you into like entrepreneurship? I know we've spoken in the past and we've spoken about improv and stuff like that. But, you know, tell us a little bit more about, you know, one improv as well. Let's touch on that. And then what made you take that shift, that shift into business and entrepreneurship? Uh, I think, man, I, I think these two disciplines are related to a certain extent where communication, improv and entrepreneurship, you know, all tie into one profession to a certain extent. So improv to me was, was a passion as a young man. Uh, I started doing improv when I was a kid. I think it was like 10 years old. I loved the entertainment part of improv, the sort of freedom and creativity, being able to be many things at one time. Uh, so this is what I liked about improv. I also did theater. Uh, it's part of my background, but improv was the most important part of my life when it comes when it came to acting. I didn't think I wanted to make a career out of improv. Like it wasn't a professional passion. And 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 then how does all of this time to entrepreneurship? I guess my improv skills have given me some sort of leverage. Uh, or no, some of my improv skills I've been able to leverage in my entrepreneurial path and career. Uh, it allows you to be much more creative when it comes to facing different challenges and ideas. It allows you to pitch better, to communicate better. So these are all skills that I've developed quite fast by doing improv. Uh, but entrepreneurship was not a choice. It was not obvious to me when I was a kid, like I never said as a seven year old kid, I want to be an entrepreneur. Like that was not me at all. Not me at all. I think I kind of fell naturally into entrepreneurship for many reasons. Yeah. I think, you know, now kind of drawing those comparisons, you know, improv is entrepreneurship. You know, I mean, you have to think on your feet every day. You got to learn on the fly. You're probably in meetings where you are always the sole decision maker. I mean, you have partners, like you said, and advisors and obviously other employees, but it's like, you have to be kind of that, that person who makes that final say, and does improv yeah. help with that, that background in improv? Of, of course, of course. Improv allows you to be very reactive to things you could never prepare. Uh, the likes of getting into a meeting and someone is 25 minutes late and you had prepared a 30 minutes presentation. The guy walks in or the girl walks in and says, all right, I have five minutes before my next meeting. What's up? Like, why are you here? Then boom. That's, that's every entrepreneur has a story like that. I do in my past. I've been, you know, in meetings where I didn't have enough time to present go loot. So what do you do when you have to summarize a 30 minutes presentation into five minutes and get to the end goal, right? So that's what improv gives you uh, because improv puts you in very different situations where you need to create a narrative and a story uh, in two minutes and, you know, get in character instantly. Whilst theater gives you two hours to install a play and a context, that's not improv. Improv is all about dynam dynamics and it's all about uh, being quick on your feet. And I think there's a lot of that in entrepreneurship. Um, when it comes to decision-making, I think there's an aspect of creativity, giving you vision, 
building stories, understanding people, because improv forces you to be different people. Uh, I've never really thought, uh, you know, to that much about my career and improv and the links between them. You kind of bring me in this space right now. <laughs> like I've never drew, drew some lines between these two passions of mine, but I think there are a lot of things that are similar in these two disciplines for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, one thing, and I don't want to skip over this. I also want you to provide some context as well about go loot. Right. And let's start yeah. off with kind of, you know, the days before you really founded go loot, what turned you on to this idea and this new emerging space that, you know, I've, yeah. I've, I think it's called sweat something that that was the only comparison I could draw between sweat, which was like, you walk and you earn like coupons for like Nike and stuff like that. That was the only thing yeah. I could compare go loot to. But you know, tell the audience, what does go loot do? How did you find the idea? Of course, yeah, sweat coins. Um, I didn't know sweat coins at the time. Um, I don't use the product either, but I'm sure it's a great company. I don't know where they are today. Like we should do a follow up on that. But yeah. I was not inspired. <laughs> I have no idea. I was not uh, inspired by sweat coins. I, Gold Dude first started off as a mobile game. So when I was 17, Pokemon Go came out. Oh, and yeah. Po yeah, 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 there you go. Had his climate <laughs> trees about... and stuff like that. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it, Everybody has that Pokemon. Everybody had that Pokemon Go moment in 2016 and 17, which is when I was 17. Um, and when the game came out, for me, it was this new realm of possibilities with mobile devices. Augmented reality was like, wow, there is a way to bridge real and virtual. There's a way to bridge what you do for fun, what has normally been such a private, very individualistic experience, which is gaming. And now it brings it outside, open world, community building, things everybody can relate to. It's healthy. There's this whole aspect that Pokemon Go brought to gaming. Open up so many opportunities I was like you know what I want to get into this space I want to start building my own game I want to do that and my idea at the time was I could use the same game mechanics as Pokemon Go and address a very different audience which was older adults parents that were not you know in the 1990s nostalgia that didn't give a damn about Pokemon Go or Pokemons in general I would address that audience by creating an augmented reality based game that would get people out in the streets to collect coupons and discounts. So real world rewards for virtual experiences. And so I brought that concept to Paris. I have family that lives in Paris and I, I did some couch surfing for a summer. I was 17. My mom stayed in a hotel with me because I was not old enough to stay in a hotel by my own. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's, that, that's a true story. So I did some couch surfing and there was this studio down in Paris that developed mobile games. They were in like in the board game space and I brought to them the concept of go loot and we started figuring out the tech. I had never been exposed to full stack development. I have never been exposed to mobile development. What were all these languages? What the hell is Swift? What's all of this? What's going on? What's UI UX design? What is architecture? What's marketing? Like I was a kid, right? And the only thing I learned in school was math and French where I come from. So. In three months, I did this crash course, very intense MBA-ish kind of like unofficial MBA where I got to learn pretty much everything, uh, or at least the basics, basics of everything. Then I brought this concept back to Montreal and the game died on its own, like just flat out heart attack. <laughs> really? Yeah. How? Yeah, well, why? the main reason was, yeah, well, two things, I think, looking back on, on my own experience, one is lack of focus. I think while there was school in my life, but also in, even in this entrepreneurial endeavor, I was trying to reinvent the wheel in terms of re mobile rewards. At the same time, I was trying to build my own game with my own IP. Like I drew characters and universes and I built like storylines and I, and I, you know, I drafted scripts for my characters. Like I was in this very creative space building a game especially like this indie local base games is so hard. It's, it's a capital extent, intensive business. Uh, you need luck. You probably need to purchase IP at some point, like a Walt Disney IP to be able to boost your customer base. I didn't have any of this. And then on the side, building a mobile rewards platform is a challenge on its own. And so mixing 
the two of them, it's like trying to create a hotel and you say, I'm going to also do like rocket ships. Only Elon Musk can do that. So <laughs> I was not the guy. And, um, and, and when the game died out, I was left with the concept of there has to be a better way to reward people for their daily habits when it comes to mobile apps. Like these virtual rewards are not enough. And there is a big disconnect between the real world that surrounds us as consumers and what we do on our mobile devices every day. And that's mm -hmm. the gap that Golu today is trying to fill. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's how we, we got there in a nutshell. Wow. Yeah, a little bit of failure, a little bit of pivoting, right? And incremental failure, right? We talk about that a lot. I don't mean to be like, hey, you failed. <laughs> no, it, it's <laughs> awesome because that's how every entrepreneur gets their start. They say no business plan survives first interaction with customers. But often the first idea still needs a, a whole ton of iterations, right? Because now people are seeing it for sometimes the first time and they're saying, this isn't exactly what we want, but here's what we do want, right? You're gaining insights into what yeah. to actually build. So, uh, I mean, that's interesting. So, I mean, you, you kind of spoke on it a little bit, but, you know, how did you get started with Golu? You, you talk about everything leading up to kind of finding how to redefine kind of habits involved. In we spoke about Hooked as well, kind of the science of behavior um, and habit yeah. formation and how it kind of ties into, you know, our use of these devices right here. So talk a little yeah. bit more about the next steps with that. Yes. So, oh, when, hold on, actually. What one more step? Ahead. And you went and raised funding, by the way. And I know you're humble. You don't want to talk about it, but do talk about that because at your age, especially, it, it, it I mean, just in general, but it, at your age, especially, they say like 2% of all entrepreneurs are able to successfully raise funding. And you joined those ranks. So, oh. if you could share your experience there, that's always very helpful and for the audience. I don't know. There was such an exclusive club. I don't know. No, it's not that I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm in the 2%. It's good to know. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> good to know. No, I, I, just kidding. But no, yeah, it's definitely part of our story. And, and it, it doesn't start like right there. So after that first failure, and I guess you're right, I, we should like literally reinvent the quote of no, you know, no product survives the first interaction with customers. Sometimes the first idea never survives <laughs> like the entrepreneurial journey. The first idea you get as an, as an entrepreneur is usually not the right one, or at least you'll have to pivot so many times to get to that right product market fit. That was my case. And so I dropped the concept of the mobile game. I dropped everything at that point and I went back to studying and what I, I could not sleep at night. Don't want to exaggerate, but it's kind of true. I could not sleep at night knowing that there was such an opportunity to reinvent the way people engage with their favorite apps every day. And so I started digging into advertising and I had already been exposed through my publisher app developer experience to the realm of mobile advertising, the companies like Unity Ads and Google AdMob and Facebook Ads that are very lucrative businesses. And they make a great job at pushing traditional videos, hyper-targeted to whatever you've been searching on the web. Uh, you see banners on mobile, you see interstitials, you see all these things, but the fact of the matter is they don't provide any value to you as a consumer, let alone to the app you're actually using at that moment. It's a disruptive experience that we've learned to cope with as modern consumers, but that's not okay. That's not what marketing is about. Marketing is about happiness, right? And that's not what's going on right now in the digital advertising world. And so I, I, I kept my concept of, if I can hyper gamify products and services in my own mobile game, why not do it in any mobile context? Why not take discounts, gift cards, vouchers, promotions, all of these things that are widely, distri widely distributed by paper right now in 2021, take these things or sometimes electronics, but it's on platforms like Groupons, et cetera. Why not take all of these little vouchers and promotions and push them in mobile contexts where users could actually win them for behaving as they always do every day? So that's how Golut really picked up. And so I built this one pager. I think I have it here also. I built this one pager and I went off to raise my first round of funding. I said, you know what? I need $300,000 to get a proof of concept in market. Like I yeah. can actually, I'll get out the paper. I'm, yeah, I'm I was about to say, <laughs> I can relate. You I'm can not, see my notebook here. It's one of like 10 that I have. <laughs> I keep it awesome. No, you have a full like textbook right there. Dude, that's, that's all the, the papers. <laughs> wow. I have a lot of papers. Um, yeah, so jokes aside, I, I said, I need to raise the first round of funding to be able to get my product on its feet. 
And I was surrounded by mentors of the Montreal ecosystem, a fund called Lune Rouge, which in French means Red Moon. The company wow. is, is managed by Guy La Liberté, CEO, ex-CEO and founder of Cirque du Soleil, which I'm sure you know. Yeah, this I've been probably... to yeah, I've been to a few of them. We have pictures of that. That's it's a... amazing. The showmanship yeah, that's of a... that in Cirque du Soleil is exactly. amazing. It's a Quebec-based business, and the founder, Guy La Liberté, is a Quebec billionaire, he's a very successful entrepreneur, and he started his own fund to support like Montreal Innovation. And so I joined unofficially their programs. Like two of their executives said, like, we're going to give you office space and we'll give you mentorship. Just do whatever you do. <laughs> like, keep doing what you do. And so I joined their incubator program that was unofficial. And I found my first round of $300,000 from local angel investors. I pitched to everybody in Montreal that had money, almost. And I was able to raise $300,000 on that first piece of paper. And the concept was, as I said, we will reward in-app behaviors with real life rewards. That was the like, simple as that. that. Was it. And it worked. That was Question. it. It worked. So that, that got me off the ground. Yeah, go ahead. Question. So... You pitched a lot of people, uh, and this is a question I have as well, because, uh, you know, there's two ways to go about it. You raise a lot from a little or a little from a lot, right? So, but each person you raise from now has, wow, look at that. That's awesome. That's my one pager. Yeah, there that you is go. Look at the old logo also. <laughs> it that is. is awesome. Man. It's in French, so I'm sure your audience won't understand what's written, but. <laughs> frame that. Proprietary frame that. IP. Yeah, yeah, frame that. That's go. awesome. But. Uh, you know, what route did you go? Did you raise a little bit of money from a lot of investors or did you go a lot from maybe three investors? You know, what was your approach there? Uh, I don't think you get to choose in pre-seed. I think you just sure. do whatever is available. <laughs> yes, right? sir. So, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like whatever works, I'll take. Like whatever you want to give me, I'll take. Just give me some money because I don't have any. Right. So I didn't get to choose. Um, I would say both. Uh, I found a lead investor in, in, in my parents' network that was a, the very successful entrepreneur that we knew very well. And I pitched him go loot. It took me a lot of time to get him on board. Like I would wait for him for hours at the gym. Like he used to work out in a gym in Montreal. I would sit at that gym in the lobby. And sometimes he would, came, he would come out on the phone and be like, damn, I got to come back tomorrow morning because I'm not going to catch him. He's on the phone. But really? there was one time when he was sitting for lunch. And I, I yeah, 100% true. And I got to pitch him go loot and he believed in me. And he said, you know what? I'll get you, I'll get you half of your funding. And he said, you're, you're in the, you're in the uh, like coupon space. So you need to work with restaurants. And there's this very large firm in Canada that's called MTY and they own a shit ton of restaurants, like fast food, sushi shops, whatever, very famous companies for lo for local people in Canada. MTY is one of the largest groups in Canada. And I swear to God, in that meeting, he said, I know someone from MTY. Let me call him right now. Picked up the phone, called the guy from MTY. He said, I'm sitting with a kid that just pitched me an idea. I'm investing. You have to listen to this. I'm handing me the phone. I was, <laughs> I was, I, I've been waiting for days to meet that guy. And in one single meeting, two investors. And so wow. the second person didn't invest. Like at the end of the day, it never happened for okay. many reasons. But that first guy sticked with me and, and then I closed the other half with more and more people. But then as you get investors, they'll start splitting the pie with their buddies. Like they'll say, I'm getting my partner in and blah, blah, blah. So I did whatever it takes to close, but it took me all in all, like 90 days of full on hard work, obviously skip the preparation part before that's years of work, but 90 days of full time fundraising to get my first money. I was lucky to find that committed entrepreneur that just said yeah you know what <laughs> i'm doing this <laughs> so yeah that's 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 the first round must not have been leg day you know a, a, after a leg day you're not <laughs> investing in anything except for a protein shake and a good chair but <laughs> exactly. if you had a good chest day or arm day he was like yeah i'm ready for yeah. the world man it pitches this, <laughs> pitch this idea that's exactly awesome. he was pumped and <laughs> the guy was pumped. maybe that's post post protein shake pitch that's my guess yeah. he was like all in it <laughs> yeah you're like, he's all pumped, man he invested 150k <laughs> i was like let's go right there <laughs> yeah that's incredible yeah, man exactly. that's 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 a beautiful story man I, I love it and you know since then i mean once you get funding yeah. that's half the battle right and it's a big battle but then you have to decide what to do with that funding 
and then you have mm-hmm. to form a team and then you have to establish personality fit and skill fit and stuff like that. And that can arguably be more difficult than finding product market fit. So how did you go about that next phase? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's even harder than to find product market fit indeed, especially if you, if you can naturally define the traction of your product by market trends. Like if you see that it's necessary, uh, somewhat like Uber, which was this universal problem, taxis were shit and anybody, everybody needed an alternative to taxi. These companies get to PMF pretty fast. I think it was somewhat the case for GoLoot. Like couponing had not been reinvented for years, aside from Groupon, which is a success failure, right? So a $18 billion IPO. And I think today it's, it's worth 120th of that, if I'm mm. not mistaken. So success, failure, weird space, advertising had not changed for 20 years. I knew something could be done, uh, but $300,000 doesn't get you that far. And what I realized pretty quickly is you burn money so fast. <laughs> like money flies out of the bank account. It's, it's, it's always on fire. And so I hired an external development team because I was still in school, right? So I hired an external development team that was under the supervision of that fun, Lune Rouge, Red Moon, that I told you about. And, and, and then I, my CTO, Jacques, that, I, that, I, that works with me right now, I met him on a Montreal terrace and he joined me as advisor to the venture. I pitched him go loot. He loved it. Joined me as advisor and he started supervising the tech that we were building externally, right? And our mission was to get with our money to at least having a proof of concept in terms of the tech, the foundation. Took us a few months and I hired my first employee in February of 2020. That's um, a year ago. Um, And so I dumped the external partners, but then I looked at my bank statements and I said, all right, (laughs) now I have somebody's mouth to feed and I raised $300,000 less than a year ago. Like I need to raise more. And it's in February of 2020. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, 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 that now begins part four, which probably is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life and far harder than anything thing that I've accomplished so far in go lose. Although everything is hard. This was quite a moment. Like this is quite a moment. Yeah. And yeah, talk more about it. Let's get a little bit suspense <laughs> yeah. here. I feel like we need to run I, an ad right before you, you touch on it. You know, <laughs> that's I'm giving you a room to put whatever you need to, <laughs> or if you want to ask a follow up question. <laughs> yeah. Look I'm at this. This, this uh... is the advertiser through and through. He's like reverse engineering the episode for a good ad placement. <laughs> exactly. Look, I, I like, I've been studying advertising for years now. So I, uh, I I give you room to put interstitials in your episode. Kidding. Absolutely. Uh, I appreciate so yeah. that. That's a good tip of the hat. But yeah, man. Let's let's dive into it. <laughs> let's dive right into it then. Now that the audience has wasted 30 seconds of uh, just being <laughs> on a cliffhanger. So yeah, it, 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 it's, it's my seed round that opens up. This ad is brought uh, to you to- by kombucha. And we need <laughs> <laughs> drink, the, exactly. drink healthy while you listen to your podcast show. Yeah, dude. Uh, you don't know how much Contra kombucha me. could have paid for that. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Free ad. Yeah. But yeah, dive right. into it, man. I'm excited. I'm diving right into it. So so it's the beginning of my seed round. I need to raise more money to support my now two-man team, which is me and this developer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I opened up my round in February of 2020. And I start meeting everybody that I know in Montreal. And one of my tricks was to meet the parents of my buddies in high school. I would go out in the cafeteria and I was like, I saw your dad on LinkedIn. He does this, this. Can I talk to your dad? And kids were like, yeah, sure. You can talk to my dad. Why can we not? have a business so, lunch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was my uh, modus operandi. That was my modus operandi. That's how what does that I stand for, about, by the way. It's a Never Latin that. word that is modus operandi. It's a Latin quote that is uh so modus is like mode it's how you get to something what mode you're in right in french it's it's since latin and french are pretty close it's how you get to something and then operandi is like your operation so Mm. what operation are you using to get to something modus operandi is a latin quote that says like how do you do something or how do you get about to to a conclusion or to an event whatever so my modus operandi to raise my seed round was uh, to one of my tricks was to call up the fathers of my buddies and then to get those meetings. And it worked pretty fine. I got to meet incredible people. Uh, one of them is Joe Leonoff, 
who's the founder and CEO, ex-CEO now of Paysafe, which is one of the largest payments company in the world. And he sold his business for $4 billion. Um, I think, or the company IPO for $4 billion. And in the case of very successful men, they, 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 they employ thousands of people across a dozen offices around the world. Like it's crazy. Um, I got to meet him in his Montreal downtown office for 30 minutes to pitch him go loot. And I, and, and I, I, obviously I was prepared. I had my pitch deck. It's not a piece of paper anymore. I had a lot more preparation and a one man team. Uh, let's not forget. So I pitched him Golut and I was looking to raise $2 million. So a leap up from three, 300 K to 2 million. Yeah. I had built my budgets and everything. Like I knew what I wanted to do. And, uh, in that specific meeting, Joel told me, if I give you a million dollars, what do you, what do you say? I'm an, I just turned 18 and, <laughs> and like, this was like a lightning strike for me. And so Joel was the first person to commit in the round, become my lead investor. But then obviously as lucky as I was COVID-19 hit. So the world is it was struck by a pandemic and I was out there trying to raise money for my venture. And obviously Joel started not returning my calls and cause he had a business to run aka pay safe that had to shut down 13 offices instantly. And then everything was starting wow. to e-com and he had digital payment solution. So it's about expanding that. And they were about to get probably their most profitable year ever. Uh, and they did acquisitions. They bought other companies like PaySafe became very successful under Joel's and other people's management. So I was not a priority. Let's put it like that. <laughs> a million dollar priority, definitely not. And so I had to find a way to make him understand how valuable Golut could be in this specific context, which is a pandemic and a post-pandemic world. And as lucky as I was, like the pandemic created a trend in digital commerce, mobile usage, adoption of mobile games across any audience, whether you're teenagers up to adults, digital advertising rose through the roof because you could not buy print anymore. Nobody was going to buy like posters next to the highway because everybody was in lockdown. So digital ads were their way to go. So Golut was like right in this context of what should have happened in 10 years when it comes to digital transformation is happening right now. And that's what I pitched to Joel. Make him understand the urgency of we need to raise this money right now. And I knew that if I didn't raise, obviously it meant shutting up the project. So uh, Joel was hesitant. There's a lot of money to be done on the stock market, obviously, because some stocks just crashed for no reason. And so he said, I could just put my money in like Bank of America. I do 40% return in a year. Why would I give it to a startup? So all those conversations were, <laughs> were complex, but he finally trusted me. And he said, like, he understood my pitch and my vision of how the pandemic would change the world. And we were a month in this pandemic and I saw the signs and it was written everywhere. Experts were talking about it. So I just exposed what I was seeing in this world. And it allows us, it allowed us to close around but it was six months of stress and anxiety and we might not make it. And at the same time, I was trying to find my talent because I had seats to fill. Like who's going to be my CTO? Now I had Jack as an advisor. Jack had his own job. And the pandemic is not the right time to change jobs. Like if you have a sustainable income, you stick to that job. And I'm this kid telling you, change, like quit everything you know, come work for me unproven 19 year old founder, but it's going to work. Right. So all this narrative was very hard to support, but look, we made it happen. Like through everything I, we absolutely made it happen. And on the 5th of June, which is four days before my birthday, uh, the round closed. And then it opened up the chapter of gold loot, which we are still writing as we speak, hiring 10 new employees, uh, Jacques joining us as CTO, Alex, a CPO marketing's a team is led by Pierce, an amazingly talented individual. Uh, we have a product owner, Regine, you have a team of developers right now, Call Marvin, we're still hiring someone in content marketing. Like the company took off in eight months and we're a few weeks away from releasing our MVP with three client partners. We're talking to many organizations. We're looking forward to being able to use GoLoot. There's so much traction pre-release. Looking to raise more money in September, built an advisory board that's now comprised of uh, Mitch Garber, famous Montreal entrepreneur, Jason Lapp, 
famous Silicon Valley entrepreneur, uh, Nadia Petrolito, who's an executive from L'Oreal, Thierry Pepin, who's a French entrepreneur. All of this network just joined in GoLoot and, and we it, really took it, off. Is L'Oreal a, a French company? I just, I just put those together. It is, isn't it? Yeah, L'Oreal, L'Oreal is indeed a French company. I just, I just thought about that. I was like, oh, that name does sound very French. That makes sense. <laughs> it is. It's, it's the Betancourt oh. family that owns L'Oreal. So really? it's a French wow. company. Yeah. And you have them on your advisory board. No, I, ha- I don't have the Betancourt family. I wish I did. <laughs> this is a very wealthy family, but I have one of their C-level executives on my advisory board, Nadia. Uh, awesome. She gives us this whole perspective on retail and obviously women's trend, which is very important advertising. Uh, CPG trends. So Nadia is, is, is a very valuable advisor. So is every single one of them on my advisory board. And that's what Godot became throughout this whole story and stress and anxiety and ups and downs. That's where we are right now. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. And you know, one thing, and you may not be used to ask, uh, answering this as well. I'm not going to ask you questions about how you structured your cap table and stuff like that, but what software did you use? Did you use you know, any preferred software to, to track it or did you just go old fashioned Excel spreadsheet? Uh, absolutely 100% old fashioned Excel spreadsheet. Really? And, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, uh, 100%. My first cap table was an Excel spreadsheet. I would keep track of my investors contact information using Word and I would, I would, I would manually update the position of every investor, like how much money are they committed? And then I would get a call. Uh, all right, I'm going to split my 200,000 with this buddy. All right, can I get his contact info? Ta, 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 I would type it in the Excel. I, I went wow. the old way of doing things. And surprisingly, even the lawyers used Excel as really? primary software to build a cap table. Yeah, 100%. Wow. Yeah, because I'm flooded with different suggestions. You know, like Estrella is one. There, There's just so many. Um, angel investors I speak to, they're like, we prefer this software. We prefer that. I'm like, oh, okay. I was just kind of keeping a track of it in Excel as well, or like uh, Google Docs sheets. But wow, man. I mean, that's incredible. To... Broken, don't fix it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, whatever's most feasible. I, I said, right? if it's not broken, don't fix it. Excel works. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, this is, it's an incredible story. And you guys are about to launch. Like, you know, the, technically, what is your company valued at right before launch? Oh my God, that's that's private information, but you can guess that the company is 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 valued in obviously the million since we raised over two point three million dollars under two point three million dollars in our lifetime. I sadly, cannot share the information on the cap table, but it's a multi million dollar startup that we're running right now, looking to raise more and more money. But what's more important is not the valuation of the previous round. What matters to me is the valuation that's coming up and how much value we can build as a team. So I try exactly. to not look back on these past numbers, try to look at how much value can I build before I have to raise more money. So you should ask me, how much money do I think this company is worth <laughs> in September? That would be That's the better right. question. I want to give you a little tip of the hat because, you know, one thing that I was going to mention, there's there's certain things I've noticed about you from an operations perspective, how you manage being a young CEO. And it seems like you handle it with due diligence, right? You really make sure you immerse yourselves in each of the processes use that Latin terminology. I can't pronounce it, but not only that, the way the kind of soft skills aspect of how you're humble about certain things and you kind of acknowledge the fact that you're young, but when you learn things, you simply say that I'm reflecting things that I learned and I use that knowledge to kind of relay that to the people that can help me get further, right? So that's why I, you know, I almost like throughout this episode, I was trying to find ways for you to brag a little bit and, you know, try to find ways to say like, Hey, you're a CEO of a multi-million dollar company because we didn't cover that. You know what I mean? So one congrats mm. on all accounts for, you know, not just, you know, being raised well, cause that's credit to your parents and I'm sure they're great people, but congrats on you on, are. on keeping that in your mind to always navigate these, these kind of soft skills and these personal relationships in a very effective manner. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate all the love in the comments. And yeah, I think it's, it's, it's important. I think it's partly or mainly how the way, how my parents raised me. Sorry. Uh, it's, it's mainly that uh, I just don't brag. And I always felt when I was building Colute that it was not the time. Like I, I kept Colute so secretive from my friends and my immediate network. I didn't want anybody to know what I was doing. Uh, because a lot of judgment comes right with 
with, with getting things done. And not everybody understands the entrepreneurial journey. It's surprisingly right. a very lonely journey. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, even amid your own family, some people don't understand what's going on. How do you get this money? Why are people suddenly like giving you money? What's going on? And like, how do you get to afford this and that? And it's, it's a relatively lonely journey. And so no need to brag about it. Uh, and, and so many things could still go wrong, which I know they won't. I'm very convinced about the value of my product and my team. Uh, and more importantly, our capability to get to our ambitions, but like so many things could go wrong that I have no, no room to brag whatsoever. So I focus on my next objectives and every time I achieve one of them, I tap myself on the back, but there's no time to look back. Like this is right. my startup journey so far. No time to look back. Future focus. always looking forward all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of brings me to one of my final questions for you. What is one thing that you learned about yourself, right? Like kind of personal lessons that you learned that yeah. helped you with your business journey. Yeah. We got to flirt with this question already uh, in the past and you made me reflect <laughs> a lot on this because it's a hard question. And I think my answer to this will be the same one that I gave you before, which is that when I joined the world of business <laughs> and tech startups, which is like a universe on its own, my immediate reflect, re reflex was to create a separate identity, a separate Lucas from who I was naturally to be able to cope in this new universe because I don't belong in the professional realm. I'm 19 years old. So I need to put on this, et this etiquette. I need to put on this some manners and the way I behave and what I talk about and the knowledge that I need to acquire. And so I, that was like one thing that I did at first, but I was expecting my employees and everybody around me to be authentic. And cause I wanted people to be authentic. I wanted to lead people by authenticity. I wanted to know who you were. And so more and more, as I grew into this company, I started realizing that I have to be myself through the roof. And everything that I do, the way I lead, the way I talk, the way I behave, the things I do, the things I say, it should transpire Lucas. That's the only thing that should be presented out there. And if you don't like me, then move on. And if you appreciate me, then let's work together, right? And by becoming so authentic, trying to be as authentic as possible, uh, it allowed me to be a lot more performant. And it encourages people around me to be themselves also. And when I started hiring individuals, uh, I told you about this already, People were telling me about their resume and like, okay, so I'm working for 10 years for this company and I did this and I'm a software engineer. And, and I was sitting there 20 minutes, 30 minutes past. And I'm like, I don't know that person at all. <laughs> like you talked to me about yourself, but I don't know you. And I'm about to share this journey with you. Business is like war. Like we, we're going to be like war buddies, business buddies, and I don't know who you are. So I try to force people now to tell me all about who they are as individuals. What do you like? What are your passions? Like, what do you do? Do you play chess? Do you run? I tell them I do improv and theater. I play chess, not the best. Uh, I run. So just to get into that emotional realm, that personal realm, something that I've learned in business and that I try to do as much as possible. So I would say that's my biggest lesson and I'm trying to spread it now. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautifully said. Man, yeah, you're you're the best kept secret in the entrepreneurship industry. I, I promise you that. And I think soon, <laughs> probably 2022, very soon, people will know this name. <laughs> they will yell, Lucas, we know who you are. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud of you. And uh, I can't wait to see where this Thank goes. So and much. keep me up to date with your launch, man. Like, um, what I want you to do, you know, we're signing out now. I want to thank everybody for listening. This has been by far one of my favorite episodes. Uh, Lucas, tell people how they can stay in touch with you. Um, I know on LinkedIn, you're very receptive, of course. Messages, but you know, I wouldn't say give out your email. I yeah. don't want a bunch of people emailing you unless that's something you want, but you know, let them know how they can get in touch with you and stay up to date with, uh, with go Loot's launch. Of course, best way to be kept informed of what goes on with GoLoot is to follow our LinkedIn page. And we try to build this community as much as possible of entrepreneurs. So people can follow our LinkedIn page. You can also add me on LinkedIn. I do respond to my DMs if it's not spam or like business opportunities. I'll respond to anyone who's genuine and authentic. <laughs> if I read it and it's, 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 it's a copy draft, uh, you're not going to get me. You can also find me on Clubhouse. 
and my email is in Clubhouse. So if you go follow me on Clubhouse, you can drop me an email. We can connect. We can talk. We can discuss. It'd be my pleasure. I love to talk about entrepreneurship, ideas, funding, opportunities. Like that's all I'm about. So yeah, that's the best way to reach me. I just want to thank you, Ethan. You've been an incredible moderator and you give me this platform. So look, this is awesome. You're full of compliments and love, something that I appreciate. And uh, you're doing an amazing job of what you do. Obviously, thank you for the audience for this time today. Absolutely. Guys, don't abuse this contact information. Lucas, thank you so much for joining. <laughs> thank you so much. Take care.